Hey guys, today we're going to be talking about igneous rock textures. First, what are igneous textures and why are they important? Igneous textures and structures are used to understand how rocks crystallized. So their crystallization history is kind of told by their textures and structures. But what are these? Well, the textures are small scale features on igneous rocks, such as the size, shape, and arrangement of their constituents. So grain size, the grain shapes, arrangement of the grains. And we'll talk about all of this in this video. But what does constituents mean? Well, that just means the minerals, glass, and cavities contained within that igneous rock. And textures provide information about the rate the rock crystallized, as well as the phase relations between the minerals and the magma at the time of crystallization, which is something we'll talk more about in a later video. This video is all about recognizing igneous textures and how those textures formed. But I also mentioned something called igneous structures. What are these? Well, these are larger scale features that we'll discuss in the next video all about igneous rock structures. So this video is all going to be about textures. Before we get to identifying the major types of igneous textures and igneous rocks themselves, we have to talk a little bit about how these textures come about. And to do that, we need to talk a little bit about how igneous rocks form. And I thought it was funny that my book says that we can understand how igneous rocks form by using basic thermodynamics. And I thought that was funny because that to me sounds a little bit like an oxymoron. <laughs> thermodynamics to me has always started out relatively simple and then just gone off the deep end in complexity. And I'm not the best at understanding it, but I actually got a lot better just through making this video. So I hope that I can at least convey to you the basic concepts that we'll go over today of how igneous rocks form and the thermodynamics that's associated with that. So that's why I say, don't worry, we'll keep it relatively surface level for this video. So the reason that thermodynamics is really useful in igneous petrology is because it helps us figure out what a simple of solids and liquids and gases are stable from a set of chemical compounds at a given temperature and pressure. And this is exactly what we want to know when it comes to igneous petrology and how igneous rocks have formed. We want to be able to predict the minerals that will form from a certain melt. And we can do that by knowing what assemblages occur due to certain temperatures and pressures given a set of chemical compounds available. And you've probably heard of Bones reaction series, which tells us which minerals crystallize at which temperature ranges, which is super helpful, as you might imagine. However, this was determined experimentally rather than by thermodynamic calculations. And so I actually go over Bowen's reaction series in a separate video that I made a long time ago. I think it's called like Igneous Rocks and Bowen's Reaction Series. I'll link it up here if you want to go watch that and learn more about the reaction series itself. And I'll probably talk about it more in later Igneous Petrology playlist videos as well. So don't worry about that right now, but in today's video, we need to talk a little bit more about the thermodynamics and the calculations behind what we can predict when it comes to chemical compositions and textures of igneous rocks. So for the thermodynamics of it all, we need to talk about crystallization because that's the reaction that's occurring that we can understand better using thermodynamics. So how and why does crystallization begin or how and why does this crystallization reaction get kicked off? So reactions such as crystallization must have a a G value of less than zero to occur spontaneously. What the heck is G? Well, G is Gibbs free energy. What is Gibbs free energy? Gibbs free energy is the amount of energy released by a chemical reaction that can be used for chemical work. If you don't understand that, don't worry. We're going to walk through this step by step. So basically, Gibbs free energy is calculated by using two main variables. These are enthalpy and entropy. What is enthalpy? So enthalpy is heat stored within the bonds of a substance. And because bond strengths vary, he can either be released or consumed due to a chemical reaction. The general rule of thumb is that the more bonds that are breaking during a chemical reaction, the more energy that will be needed or consumed during that reaction because it takes energy to break bonds. However, if you have a chemical reaction that is causing the building of more bonds than it is breaking, then it will likely release more heat than it is consuming because it releases heat when you build bonds. So we can see this 
down here in the bottom left figure, we have heat absorbed by a chemical reaction. That is called an endothermic reaction. And when heat is released by a chemical reaction, it's called an exothermic reaction. So when a chemical reaction is breaking bonds, you have an endothermic reaction. And when it is building bonds, you have an exothermic reaction, aka when the change in enthalpy is negative. So when heat is released due to building bonds, you have an exothermic reaction. And that can occur spontaneously, like we mentioned up here when you have a G value of less than zero. However, that's not the entire story. There's another component to our equation. This is entropy. Why is entropy important? Well, if we look at the calculation of G or Gibbs free energy, the amount of energy released by a given chemical reaction, we can see that it not only takes into account the change in enthalpy, but also the change in entropy as well as T for temperature. And entropy is a measure of disorder or randomness. And so an example is elements within gases will have higher entropies than they do in solids because they're more disordered or random within gases and they're more ordered in a framework in solids. Another example going into solids only, we can see that in solids with Van der Waals bonds have higher entropy values than when bonded covalently because the bond strengths of Van der Waals bonds are lower than the bond strengths of covalent bonds. And I talk about that more in my crystal structures video. I'll link it up here if you want to check that out. But the general theme is that if S or entropy increases during a reaction, the reaction will have an easier time being spontaneous, but it also depends on H. So it depends. And if S decreases during the reaction, it will hinder that reaction's progress. And so that all depends on H as well. You can't just predict a reaction's spontaneity based on S or based on H. It takes both values. Because say you have an H that is negative, aka the reaction is releasing heat and your change in enthalpy is negative because you're releasing heat, it's going out of the system, that would mean that your reaction is likely to be spontaneous. However, if your change in entropy is so low, meaning that the entropy decreases so much that the G becomes positive or goes above zero, your reaction cannot occur spontaneously. And so they both depend on each other for the overall G value to either be above zero, below zero, or equal to zero, which are the kind of scenarios we'll talk about here. So summing it up, if H decreases and S increases, aka heat is released and entropy is increased or disorder is increased, then the G value will be lower than zero and proceed spontaneously. Why? Well, we can see that if H is sufficiently low or negative and the change in S is sufficiently positive, then this value will be as low as it can and therefore G value will definitely be below zero. And when it's less than zero, that reaction will just go ahead and start in those conditions because that release of heat and increase in disorder is thermodynamically favorable. Now the question is, is crystallization a spontaneous process or reaction? Well, we know that crystallization is a melt going to a solid. So it involves building bonds. And we talked about how building bonds releases heat, aka you will have a negative H value or change in H value. And that means that it would likely be exothermic and spontaneous. However, to determine whether it will occur spontaneously, we need to also consider S or entropy. Does S increase or does it decrease? Well, entropy will likely decrease during crystallization because the atoms are becoming more ordered, not less ordered. However, this is typically outweighed by the H decrease. So you will likely get a G value that is still lower than zero and therefore a spontaneous reaction that will just occur because it's thermodynamically favorable. However, the last thing we also have to consider is temperature. So obviously you would have to have a temperature that also makes that process thermodynamically favorable. You can probably imagine that if your temperature is too high, the melt will want to stay melt and not cool down enough to crystallize. And this makes sense in our equation because if your change in entropy is negative and you're multiplying it by a really high temperature value, you're going to get an increase in that negative value. And when you minus a negative, you're going to change that to a positive and eventually that number will become so high that G becomes positive, goes over zero, and will not occur spontaneously. So temperature increase obviously will stop the crystallization from happening and will keep the melt a uh, melt. However, if the temperature is sufficiently low that crystallization becomes favorable with your H value, your S value, and your temperature value all considered, then it will occur spontaneously. So now that we have the thermodynamics part out of the way, I want to introduce a little more complexity. Sorry, theoretical calculations don't always work in natural environments. So even though 
a crystallization reaction might have a G value less than zero, it's not completely given that it will occur spontaneously just yet. That's because it may have an energy barrier to overcome. And when it can't overcome that energy barrier, it's in a state called metastable. But generally, you can assume that if you are at low enough temperatures for a melt to crystallize, it will likely do so spontaneously because that reaction will have a negative H. It will release heat because it's building bonds and that is thermodynamically favorable. However, again, another however, I'm sorry, crystallization involves more than just thermodynamically favorable conditions. Oh, I know. I know. I'm sorry. It's just how the world works. It also involves what's called nucleation and growth of crystals, which are dependent on something called diffusion or diffusion rates. What are diffusion rates? So diffusion rates are the rates at which ions of various elements can move through a melt. So ions of a similar size and charge, such as calcium 2 plus, magnesium 2 plus, and iron 2 plus, diffuse at similar rates. And that makes sense because they all have a similar charge and a similar size. However, if you have a larger ion with a different charge, such as sodium plus one, it diffuses slower. So ions move at different rates through melts, and that causes their diffusion rates to be different. However, size and charge of ions is not the only thing that can control their diffusion rates. Diffusion rates can also be affected by viscosity. As you could probably imagine, if it's more viscous, which is just resistance to flow, so more viscous material would be like honey, compared to really low viscosity material like water. Water flows a lot more easily than honey does. And so if you have a more honey-like magma or melt diffusion, rates get a lot slower because it's hard for those ions to move around. It's like, oh gosh, I'm trying to go, but this honey is so thick and viscous and I can't go anywhere. And so then when the viscosity increases, however, if you have a melt that is as low viscosity as water is, you can imagine that the ions can move a lot more faster because you have this fluidity, this movement, it's fast moving, it's not resistant to flow, it's it's way less viscous. And so it's way easier for those ions to move around in those melts. And the general observation is that basaltic melts tend to be much less viscous than more siliceous melts such as rhyolitic melts. And you can also use their plutonic equivalents to talk about these types of melts as well. Basalt would be equivalent to gabbroic magmas, so gabbro is just the plutonic equivalent to basalt, and rhyolite would be equivalent to the plutonic granitic magmas. And we talk about all that classification stuff in the igneous rock classification video, so if you haven't seen that, I'll link it up here for you. Go watch that if you're confused confused about the rock names themselves. But now we have to talk about nucleation and growth of crystals because we talked about how nucleation and growth of crystals is controlled by diffusion rates. And we talked about how viscosity and size and charge of ions affects diffusion rates. But how does these diffusion rates changing affect nucleation and growth of crystals? Well, first, what is nucleation? Nucleation just means like the start of a crystal grain. It starts with like this nucleus of charged particles or ions that are are clustered together and then eventually it becomes a crystal grain with more ions diffusing to it, moving to it, and becoming larger. And that then, in that stage, once it's already a nucleus and it's attracting more ions that are diffusing to it and it's growing, that is then called growth. So you have nucleation, which is like the beginning of a crystal grain, and you have growth, which is after the nucleus has been established, ions continue to add to it, and it's growing. So nucleation, then growth. And nucleation rates of crystals increase with increasing cooling. And this makes sense because this just means that the more you cool the melt, the more favorable crystallization becomes, obviously, because once it's cooled to a sufficient temperature, it no longer can be a melt. It's not hot enough. However, this gets a little tricky because you can't just say that nucleation rates increase exponentially or linearly with increased cooling. What happens is at a certain temperature, nucleation rates reach a maximum, then drop off with further cooling. Why? Well, it actually makes sense when you think about it. So nucleation rates or rates that ions are creating nuclei for crystal grains to grow become slower with increased cooling past a certain maximum that nucleation rate reach. And that's because diffusion becomes slower. You can imagine that if you are cooling a melt to a magma and then eventually so much that it's almost crystallizing all into a rock, that at the later stages, it's becoming so viscous that those diffusion rates slow down so much 
such that nucleation can't even occur because the ions can't even diffuse through the material anymore. It's so viscous. And so nucleation of new crystal grains gets much slower at that point. And we know from previous videos that the rate at which a rock crystallizes from a melt affects the grain sizes of the crystals in that rock. And we know that that makes sense now because if you have a rock that cools really slowly or a melt that cools really slowly and forms a rock, the ions will have time to diffuse to the crystal nuclei that were formed during nucleation and grow very large grains because you're giving those ions time to move, to diffuse through that material in order to get to those nuclei and grow and grow and grow those crystal grains. That scenario is a scenario in which growth rate is greater than a nucleation rate. So you had nucleation, but the growth of those nuclei is occurring at a greater rate than the nucleation of new nuclei. And so you're getting very large crystals and less grains overall. This texture, this coarse grained texture is called phanerytic in igneous petrology. So if you have a phanerytic rock, it's relatively coarse grained throughout the entire rock. These rocks are typically like granites, which are plutonic siliceous rocks that cooled slowly or gabbro even, which are mafic, but they cooled slowly and allowed time for crystal grains to become large. However, if you have a rock that cools very quickly, the ions do not have time to diffuse to other nuclei. And so they just crystallize where they are to form very small grains because nucleation rate is greater than growth rate in that scenario. And you'll get a texture that's very fine grained called aphanitic. You can imagine something that erupts and is extrusive or volcanic out of a volcano and cools very quickly. Those ions are just going to sit where they are and nucleate and become their own little grain because they don't have time to diffuse over to some other nuclei. They're just going to chill right where they are. They're like, oh my God, I'm too cold. I can't move. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> And so they just cool right there. And so it's very, very fine grain, but a lot more grains overall. And that's called aphanitic. And we see this in a lot of basalt. They have grains, but they're very fine grained. However, if a rock cools so quickly that nuclei don't even have time to form, it will all just be grainless or I guess be one grain, I guess you could think of it as. And it's called glassy because you just, just form this one mass that has no grains. You didn't have time to nucleate and you didn't have time to grow anything. So it's just grainless. It's glassy. That's how glass forms. It just cools basically instantly. And that's glass or also called glassy texture. Um, but the rock, I guess specifically it's called obsidian, but it's just glass. So lastly, we have pegmatitic. So pegmatitic is a really coarse grain texture that forms huge, huge crystal grains. It's hard to see on this picture, but we'll show better pictures in later videos, I promise. And this happens if a melt contains volatiles, which decreases viscosity of the melt and therefore diffusion rates may increase to the point that the texture becomes very, very coarse grained or pegmatitic. And that's because the diffusion rates are very high. The rock is cooling slowly. You have all the right conditions for diffusion or growth of crystals to be really fast, whereas nucleation is not as fast. So growth rate over nucleation rate in that case, and the diffusion becomes even faster with the decrease in viscosity. And therefore you get this pegmatitic texture. So now that we've talked about crystal size, I want to talk a little bit about crystal shape and then we'll wrap it up with recapping all of the textures that we've gone over with a couple more added onto that based on crystal shape. So you've likely heard of euhedral versus anhedral crystal shapes and euhedral just means that that grain is bounded by well-formed crystal faces. We can see examples of this in the plagioclase last that are in these thin sections. We can see these crystals that have some structure to them. And that's because they formed first or crystallized first within that melt or magma and were allowed to kind of form these well crystallized shapes. However, later minerals that formed after the well formed euhedral crystal grains were constrained to only kind of filling the interstice, interstice. Oh, I can never say that word. The in-betweens of the other euhedral grains. And because of that, they formed what's called anhedral crystal shapes. And anhedral just means that they don't have well crystallized boundaries or well-defined boundaries. They're just kind of in between the rest of the crystal grains. So to sum up, euhedral crystals cooled first and more slowly and allowed them to be more well crystallized and anhedral crystals cooled later. And then if there's a fine grain matrix, which isn't really the case in these two examples, because these are relatively coarse grain, but if there is, it cooled last and most quickly. 
and therefore obviously had much finer grains, and that's why it's called the fine grain matrix. We can see examples of this in these two pictures here. This is a rock picture. We can see penny for scale. This is a thin section picture, and we can see there's a fine grain matrix material that is much finer grain, obviously, and there's coarser grain, what's called phenocrysts. These are just larger crystals scattered throughout a fine grain matrix, and this texture is called porphyritic. So when you have a fine grain matrix with coarser grains or phenocryst scattered throughout that fine grain matrix, it's called porphyritic. Now, don't get this confused with phanoritic, which is coarse grained throughout, so no fine grain matrix, just coarse grains, and porphyritic has a fine grain matrix, and then really stand out phenocrysts that are like, oh, that's larger than the rest of the rock. So that's not the case with phanoritic. So don't, don't confuse those. And then the last texture we will talk about today is vesicular. And so we see two rocks shown here. We've got pumice and we've got scoria shown here. Basically, both of these vesicular type of textures, so textures with vesicles, form when magma contains abundant gas and erupts from a volcano, causing those air bubbles or gas bubbles to be caught up in the cooling material, forming vesicles in the rock. And pumice specifically forms from gas-rich siliceous magma, which you know is why it's lighter in color. And you know this because we talked about that in the classification video, if you want to check that out. And then scoria forms from gas-rich basaltic magma. So scoria is basically mafic version of vesicular rocks, and pumice is the felsic version. So that is all I have for you guys today. We will talk in the upcoming videos about igneous rock structure structures, like I mentioned earlier, and igneous phase diagrams. And phase diagrams is going to be important for what I mentioned earlier about phase relations and what we talked about in the rock classification video about why feldspathoids and quartz can't form together. So if you want to check those videos out, they'll be out soon, or if they're out now, go check them out now. And if you're still watching this video, comment down below for me what you think is the coolest igneous rock texture. My favorite is pegmatitic because you can see these beautiful Beautiful, like huge crystals and I'm a lover of tourmaline so I must say that I love seeing huge tourmaline crystals which are like these black column like structures or well they can be other colors too which are pretty awesome but I've never found any of those myself so let me know in the comments down below what your favorite is and lastly the major reference I'm using to make this video is the textbook essentials of igneous and metamorphic petrology by Ronald and Carol Frost and that'll be linked down down below for you if you want to go check that out. So with that, that's all I got for you guys today. I hope you enjoyed the video and thanks for sticking with me. It is five something in the morning, so I'm sure there'll be a lot of bloopers, so stick around. Anyway, that's it. Thanks again. <laughs> Bye guys. So reactions such as crystallization, much, much, why can't I speak? So diffusion rates, so diffusion rates are the rates, mm, why can't I say this sentence? Well, diffusion rates are the rates at which, uh, mm, I swear guys. <sighs> <sighs> Spend so much time just repeating myself and then not getting it out. Sometimes it cools really coolly. Coolly. Cools really coolly. <laughs> oh, but it does. Tells us which mineralized crystal, which mineralized crystal. <laughs> Which minerals crystallize? Oh, this is why I don't record at 5 a.m.